last more than 51 years maharaj is actively uh, practicing and preaching this message of krishna consciousness <clears throat> one time there was discussion who is greater mahatma gandhi or shila prabhupada so then one devotee said that mahatma gandhi drew away all britishers away from india but shila prabhupada went and brought britishers back to india <laughs> but in changed dress in vaishnava dress with dhoti kurta tilak kanti mala hmm? like maharaj is one of them coming from england uh, to preach the message of actually india last <clears throat> india apparently is celebrating azadi ka amrit mahotsav but most of the india has lost indian culture vedic culture uh, because now people are very much fascinated by western culture but robert went to america he went to europe he went to australia he went to africa all over the world and presented this uh, vedic wisdom and he transformed the lives of so many youngsters uh, who came forward and dedicated life and now they have brought out great spiritual revolution all over the world <clears throat> One time, Prabhupada used to say, Prabhupada was staying in Allahabad. So there, Motilal Nehru used to stay, father of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India. So Motilal Nehru used to pay 10 times more to with, uh, one servant. He had a British servant. Though India was being ruled by Britishers, but he himself had uh, hired one Britisher and he was paying 10 times more salary to him. And he would not do any work also. <laughs> so... But Prabhupada went, brought Britishers, and he did not pay a single paisa to them. But they were ready to give their entire life uh, to Krishna service, Prabhupada service. So <clears throat> it's very amazing to see how Prabhupada created a great revolution. It's, uh, uh, and we can practically see uh, when we meet Prabhupada disciples like Maharaj, how much they have love for Prabhupada, how much they have love for Lord Chaitanya and Nityananda, how much they have love for Krishna, and how in dedicated way, they are traveling and preaching, following footsteps of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada at the age of 70, left comfortable place in India, in Vrindavan, and went to America. He had so many health issues, he had no money, no contacts, and he practically single-handedly did uh, world spiritual revolution. And we see his disciples, like Maharaj. Maharaj is also now 70 plus years, 75 years maybe now. And uh, he's also, you know, uh, practically no money, nothing, but he travels all the world uh, preaching enthusiastically. At this age, we see our grandfathers and all these things, they have so much struggle sitting at home and just maintaining their lives, you know. At such age, uh, we can see Maharaj so blissful, so enthusiastic and preaching the message of Krishna consciousness in a dedicated way. <clears throat> I was asking Maharaj, you are spending so much time in India, why don't you be Indian citizen? He said, in Indian system, there are so many rules and regulations. And they asked me bank account, but I don't have any bank account, you know. <laughs> so, Maharaj, just depending on Krishna and you no, know, in a very uh, wonderful way, uh, following uh, uh, example of Srila Prabhupada. So Maharaj uh, was Brahmachari in ISKCON, Calcutta, way back in 1970s. He was also later on active member of a traveling Sankirtan party, especially library party. Uh, which was instrumental in placing Srila Prabhupada books in all over major universities and colleges in India. Also, Maharaj was temple president of ISKCON Hyderabad. So he has done many wonderful services uh, in ISKCON. Later on, he was awarded sannyas. Uh, and after sannyas, he has been... Uh, there was no much difference in lifestyle because he was already uh, living like a sannyasi. But he increased his preaching. Maharaj travels to... China, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, so many, uh, India, and uh, used uh, <clears throat> wonderful seminars. He also teaches Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav, Bhakti Vedanta, and so many other courses. <clears throat> As yesterday I was telling, Maharaj is uh, very exemplary. In Chaitanya Charitamrit, we see uh, Sanatana Goswami is talking about Haridas Thakur, that Haridas Thakur, he is glorifying Haridas Thakur, that some people, Preach, but they don't behave properly. And some people behave properly, but they don't preach. Sanatan Goswami said, but oh Haridas, your behavior is exemplary and your preaching is also exemplary. 
so similarly maharaj also very exemplary preacher and uh, so very wonderful example for all of us to uh, look up to and get inspired and practice krishna consciousness maharaj is also initiating spiritual master in iskon and we are very grateful that maharaj every year uh, comes to mayapur and also he comes to calcutta and every year we get his wonderful session this year we are really blessed that on this occasion of youth camp uh, we have a session of his uh, bhakti vidya nashakna samaras so let us uh, thank maharaj and welcome maharaj for this camp by loudly chanting three times Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 narayanam namaskrityam narayanam namaskrityam naram chaiva narottamam naram chaiva narottamam daivim sarasatim vyasam daivim sarasatim vyasam to jaya mudhiraya to jaya mudhiraya namaste preshu Trishu, Nityam Bhagavata Sivaya, Nityam Bhagavata Sivaya, Bhagavati Uttama Shloke, Bhagavati Uttama Shloke, Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki, Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki, This morning we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter Number 6, entitled Prahlad Instructs Manik Schoolmates. Text Number 1. Shri Prahlad Vacha, Kumaraptarat Pragno, Dharmam Bhagavatam Neha, Manushan Janma, Adapya Druva Matadam, Sri Prahlad Vacha, Omar Acharat Ragna, Dharmam Bhagatam Miha, Dharmam Bhagatam Janma, Sadapya Dhruva Matadam Shri Prahlad Vacha Komaram Achari Pragyo Arman Bhagavatam Said, Kumara, Kumara 
in the tender age of childhood in the tender age of childhood acharat acharat should practice should practice pragna pragya one who is intelligent one who is intelligent dharman dharman occupational duties occupational duties Bhagavatan, which are devotional service to the supreme personality of Godhead. Iha, in this life, do labam, very readily attained. Manusham, human, janma, verb. Tat, tat, that, that api, api, even, even adruvam, adruvam, impermanent, impermanent temporary, temporary, artadam, artadam, full of meaning, full of meaning. Translation. Prahlad Maharaj said, no, 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 just listen. One who is sufficiently intelligent should use the human form of body from the very beginning of life. In other words, from the tender age of childhood, to practice the activities of devotion service, giving up all other engagements. The human body is most readily achieved. And although temporary, like other bodies, it is meaningful because in human life, one can perform devotional service. Even a slight amount of sincere devotional service can give one complete perfection. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The whole purpose of Vedic civilization and of reading the Vedas is to attain the perfect stage of devotional service in the human form of life. According to the Vedic system, therefore, from the very beginning of life, the brahmachari system is introduced so that from one's very childhood, from the age of five years, one can practice modifying one's human activities so as to engage perfectly in devotional service. As confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 240, Swalpam Apiyasya Dharmasya Trayate Mahato Vayash. Even a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Modern civilization, not referring to the verdicts of Vedic literature is so cruel to the members of human society that instead of teaching children to become brahmachari, it teaches mothers to kill their children, even in the womb, on the plea of curbing the increase of population. And if by chance, a child is saved, he is educated only for sense gratification. Gradually, throughout the entire world, human society is losing interest in the perfection of life. Indeed, men are living like cats and dogs, spoiling the duration of their human lives by actually preparing to transmigrate again to the degraded species among the 8,400,000 forms of life. The Krishna consciousness movement is anxious to serve human society by teaching people to perform devotional service, which can save a human being from being degraded again to animal life. As already stated by Prahlad Maharaj, Bhagavad Dharma consists of Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu, Smaranam Padasevanam, Archanam Vandanam Dashyam, Sakyam Atmani Vidanam. In all the schools, 
colleges and universities and at home, all children, youths should be taught to hear about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In other words, they should be taught to hear the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, to put them into practice in their lives and thus to become strong in devotional service, free from fear of being degraded to animal life. Following Bhagavad Dharma has been made extremely easy in this age of Kali. The Shastra says, Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Hari Nama Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasteva, 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 Gatir Anyata. One need only chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Everyone engaged in the, in the practice of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra will be completely cleansed from the core of his heart and be saved from the cycle of birth and death. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chatsur Militani Asmai Shri Gurave Nama Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Tapitam Yena Bhutave Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shya Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Tahagana Ragnatam Vikam Tam Sajevam Sarvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakani Tamstya He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Tagatate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrinda Vigneshwari Vrishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Vaivacha Patita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasati Kaurvaktam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So I think Srila Prabhupada wrote the purport this morning just for this event here today. All of you coming for this youth festival, the purport is very appropriate. It tells very clearly the importance of the human form of life and how we have to take advantage of this human form of life to cultivate Krishna consciousness. We have to be very careful not to waste this valuable opportunity to be Krishna conscious. Prahlad Maharaj will go on to explain, well, he's explaining just now the importance that from the beginning of life, we should cultivate Krishna consciousness. I remember when I became the devotee, of course, none of you were born. <laughs> You were all in other bodies. <laughs> you were old people. <laughs> or maybe even old cows or something. We don't know. But anyway, uh, 
I was remembering when I joined the Krishna consciousness movement that I thought, oh, I've come, I joined, I was 21, 22. I just turned 22 maybe. But I joined the Krishna consciousness movement and I thought, oh, I joined so late. I thought if only I come to Krishna consciousness earlier. So I had that realization coming to Krishna consciousness, how special this Krishna consciousness movement is and how the education which we get in Krishna consciousness is so important. I was giving a class the other day and somebody asked the question, they said, uh, what were you doing before you became a devotee? So I told them, I said, I was wasting my life. <laughs> and I think that point is also brought out in the purport here today that Srila Prabhupada is saying, there's no need to do anything else. You just have to cultivate Krishna consciousness. If you spend your time you know, doing other things, it's just a, it's a diversion from the real goal of life. Because whatever we do in this material world, all your activities for the body, the material education, it is all centered around sense gratification. It's all just part of the illusion of the material world. We want to understand the reality, not the illusion. The reality is that we're all spirit souls and we're living in a temporary material body. We have wasted many, many lifetimes in this material world away from Krishna. Now we have an opportunity to come back to Krishna somehow by the mercy of devotees, we have contacted this Krishna consciousness movement. But the, the seed of devotion has been put into our hearts. Now we have to take up that watering process. And the watering process means hearing and chanting. That is the foundation of the watering process. We don't want to get diverted with other things. Later on, Prahlad Maharaj will go on to explain that some people will make the excuse, they will say, well, when I'm old, I'll take up Krishna consciousness. Somebody also was saying recently to me that, you know, let me enjoy now. And then later on, I'll take up Krishna consciousness. I, I said, I don't believe it. Can you guarantee me? And nobody. I didn't, can you even guarantee you will live to, to, until you're 50? You don't have that guarantee. People are dying. We, had, we just had a COVID pandemic. Many people died. Much under, many people under 50 died. So people often talk in this way. It's just nonsense. It's cheating. It's not true. And Prahlad Maharaj also explains, you're going to wait till you're old. It will be very difficult to take up Krishna consciousness in your old age. We have a saying, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. If you've had a life of sense gratification, do you think you're going to give up that sense gratification just because you've come into old age? No. I see many people, many old men hankering for more sense gratification. You can go to places like, you know, people go to places like Thailand. They go to, Tha I preach also there in Thailand. So in Thailand, I see many old men there trying 
to still have sense gratification. And they come from India also. It's not that Indian men don't get, don't get old. And it's not that Indian people don't want sense gratification in old age. They do. They want it as much as everybody else. Even in Srila Prabhupada's time, Srila Prabhupada was talking to one man who was living in San Francisco. And Prabhupada was talking to him and telling him, you know, you, you, should, you should take sannyas, you know, you should renounce. But the, oh, the man was saying, oh, Swamiji, I have my son. I have my family. How can we leave them? And Prabhupada would say, well, one day you're going to leave them, whether you like it or not. You're going to be driven out from the home. Better to leave the home voluntarily. But, of course, the man could not take Prabhupada's advice. So, in old age, people who have had a life of sense gratification, they can never give up that desire. I explained to the man who was telling me like this, I said, I said, you're thinking you are having pleasure. I said, you don't know what is real pleasure. The devotees in Krishna consciousness, they experience real pleasure. Your pleasure is like the pleasure of the this, this stool eating animals, like the pigs and the dogs. Yet yeah, they have pleasure. You want that kind of pleasure? Go ahead. Eat, eat stool like the pigs. Tell me you're enjoying it. Have sex like the dogs in the street. Tell me you're enjoying. That's your pleasure? That is not pleasure. That is a pleasure of the fool. People who are like hogs, dogs, and camels and asses. So these, these people, they're described in the Bhagavatam. And we meet them every day. If you go out for preaching, you go around the world preaching, every day you can meet people who are on the level of these animals. And they're thinking, they're enjoying. Right? We often tell them the story of Indra was cursed to become a pig. Right? His guru, Brihaspati, cursed him to become a pig. And he was in his pig body, and he had his pig family, and he, every day he was getting the pig food. So after some time, Brihaspati came and told Indra, and said, okay, you've been a pig long enough, now you should come back. And Indra said, no, no, I'm happy here. I don't want to leave here. I have my pig food every day. They bring our pig food. Look, I'm, I'm happy. I'm big and fat now. I wasn't eating so much food before. And I have my pig wives and all my pig children. How I can leave them? Oh, Brihaspatita. Oh, okay. You stay here. Just a minute. I'm going to get the butcher. And so Brihaspati went came back with the butcher with a big knife. And they said, oh, where's the big fat pig? Right? So that was Indra. So Indra was screaming, oh, no, no, save me. Let me come with you. Okay. So that was how Brihaspati got home to Indra. But that tendency is there in human beings. Whatever situation they're in, they're thinking, I'm happy. I'm enjoying. If I'm not enjoying today, in the future, I will enjoy. Just like when I studied at college. You know, I went to college also. <laughs> <laughs> and I also graduated. I got my degree from the UK, you know, engineering. <laughs> Believe it or not, and I studied Laplace transformations and Fourier analysis, 
and all the other stuff that you have to put up with. Was it all useful to me? I can tell you it was useless. <laughs> totally useless. I didn't learn anything of any good. Four years, four years to graduate with a Bachelor of Science, with honors as well. <laughs> and I can tell you it's it was all useless, useless information, information technology, all useless information. The real information is in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Just read the Srimad Bhagavatam and understand what is real knowledge, what is real happiness, not the happiness of the hogs and the dogs. There is real life, but it, people are so ignorant, they have no idea how much they're suffering and how miserable their life is. Krishna consciousness can give people a better life. That is for sure. I didn't stay 50 years in the Krishna consciousness movement to be miserable. It's a better life. Everything is there. Everything. When I think about the people who I studied with, what are they doing now? You know, well, of course, they're all retired now. So what do they do in their retirement? And what have they done in their lives? You know, they, they get married and they have a few kids and they make some money. But they struggle in the corporate industry, in the world. They struggle to keep their jobs. There's always the threat of insecurity. There's always the threat of changes in technology. No, now we have so many software engineers. But if the, when the technology all changes, then everybody has to think again. What are we going to do? But this technology, spiritual technology, that is eternal. I'm making use of my life, distributing spiritual technology, the science of self-realization. That is something meaningful. I don't think the jobs which I would have done in the material world could have been so useful. I don't think people would have got any real benefit from whatever the different companies are doing. But Krishna consciousness is actually changing the lives of people, giving people real vision to understand what is this human life. So that is the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and the line of teachers which he came in. We, were, we have been fortunate. I was very fortunate. Somehow I contacted the Krishna Consciousness Movement just a few months after my graduation. I'd, I was working in London and I was going, somehow I, I bought a book, a Krishna I found yeah. I found the book. It was in a it was in a bookstore. And you know, I like I was always going to bookstores and I saw this beautiful book. It was so beautiful. I so many color pictures and the cover was all silver with this beautiful picture of the divine couple. So I, I thought I have to have this. You know, we talk about the you know, when you graduate, you get a job, you start making money, you're like the young crow, right? The young crows. Somebody was telling me the other day about how Radhanath Maharaj gives the example that the old crows and the young crows. The old crows, you know, they've tied everything before. There's nothing very new for them. But the young crow, oh, it's new, you know, I have to try this, I have to. So I was like a young crow, you know, I was 
I'm making money. I'd been a student for years and now I'm making money. I, I spend it. I got this Krishna book and I took it home and showed my friend. I was so proud of it. He said, oh, I've got a book by this person. <laughs> 1971. It was, that, that's pretty amazing. There were not many books. There were only the volume one of Krishna book was out. Volume two hadn't even been printed. Somehow I got this volume one and he had another book. And I read this other book. The other book was little book, topmost yoga system. So I, I was amazed because I didn't know, actually, I didn't know Hare Krishna had so much literature. I just used to buy the incense. The devotees used to maintain the temple. They would make incense. And I used to purchase their incense. You know, we were all young people and we liked to burn incense. We liked Ravi Shankar, not, not that other, not the modern, but the sitarist, you know, Ravi Shankar, musician, sitar. We listened to Indian music and we, uh, like incense. And so I used to buy the Hare Krishna incense and it always said, come to the temple and so on. But when I got the books, then it made sense. I read the book and it all made sense. And I, I had to go to the temple. And that's how I'm here today. I went to the temple and I was going every night to Arti. Like you were all chanting and dancing this morning. When I was 21, I was also chanting and dancing. I can't do it so well today, but <laughs> I try. Uh, anyway, I used to go every night to the RT and we would dance and dance and it was ecstatic and I loved it. And then they told me, they said, you should come for the morning program. They said, you can stay overnight. We have a morning program. And I thought, oh, it sounds good. I thought, yeah, nice, because I have a job, you know, I have a job. They said, okay, you can go to work after the morning program. We'll say prasadam for you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was coming, I stayed in the temple overnight. I was at the morning program, go to office, come home, have prasadam. Then they said after a little while, they said, you know, give up that job. <laughs> Job. Why were people so attached to their jobs? I can't believe it. This is your job, right? <laughs> So anyway, we gave up the job, became devotee, and that's how I got into Krishna consciousness. And since then, I've been traveling, went to different countries, and introduced Krishna consciousness, just like when we, I came to India in the beginning. I came to India like 1975. Uh, Gopal Krishna, who is Gopal Krishna Goswami today, he had... Uh, he was a devotee in New York, and Prabhupada wanted him to come back to India because he didn't. He, he wanted he wanted somebody to help in the management, and at that time we didn't have many devotees. There were very less Indian people joining our movement at that time. So Prabhupada brought him back from America to come to India to get involved in the management. So I was in America at that time. I, I went to America because the book distribution was much bigger then. There was a lot of book distribution. We weren't doing so many books in England, and I wanted to get more into the book distribution. 
So I went to America and we were doing book distribution, preaching there. But then the Gopal Krishna was going to India and uh, he asked the temple president, give me some men to take to India because we have, we're short of devotees. We need more men for the preaching. And it was difficult for Americans to get visa to come to India at that time. Indira Gandhi was prime minister and there was some tension, India, Pakistan, and they thought America is lined up with Pakistan. And they thought Hare Krishnas are all CIA agents. <laughs> they all thought, they thought maybe Hare Krishna are agents for the CIA. They're put into India in disguise to give information to America. That's what people thought, you know. So anyway, I was, I'm from the UK. So Gopal Krishna Maharaj said, you come with me to India. Because he said, you don't need a visa. At that time, British didn't need a visa. So I could come to India. I stayed, I stayed for four years. So at that time, that's how I ended up coming to India. And we got into pre... That time, we, we were really uh, doing pioneering preaching in India. There were only three centers. There was a, a very small rented house in Bengali market in Delhi with about six devotees. And there was a rented house in Calcutta, which we own today, Albert Road. And there was a land we were living in, a Juhu, and the devotees were living in a very primitive condition there in Juhu. Nothing was built. And then they opened the Hyderabad Temple in 1976. Vrindavan Temple was opened in 1974. So Krishna Balaram Temple was open. But it was very beginning days. We didn't have books. There were no books. Could you believe it? How to preach here in India with no books. So I was telling the story how Bhakti Charu Swami, he came as a new devotee, 1977, he was coming to the temple in Calcutta. And he was interested. We could see he was very nice. He was very educated, cultured, very special person. And he was want, wanted to know more about Krishna consciousness. So he said, can I have a book to read? So we had one Bhagavad Gita. And they, were want, they wanted to give it to him. And I protested. I said, no, we have to have class. It's our book for class. We only have one book. All the books had come from the West. There was nothing printed in India at that time. So we had one book. But we had a nectar of devotion. So I said, let him take the nectar of devotion. And he took it and he fell in love with it. He thought it was the most wonderful book. He said, if I'd read the Bhagavad Gita, it might not have been the same. But he said, after I read the Nectar of Devotion, I knew I just have to become a devotee. So that's Prabhupada's books. How Prabhupada's books, how, how much potency they have. And even one book, Prabhupada told us, he said, send the books to China. He said, even you cannot go to China. Send the books, and the books will create the preaching field. One book can be read by a thousand people. Because the books are set. Like in Russia, before in Prabhupada's time, there were no books. There was no devote. Prabhupada went to Moscow, 1976. No, no 1971, Prabhupada went to Moscow. And he met one Russian boy. There were Sham Sundar was going out to get try to find some rice to cook for Prabhupada. And he met these two young men. One was Indian boy with a Russian boy. And they said, they said to Sham Sundar, have you got any Beatles music? Because in Russia, they'd heard about the Beatles, but they were not allowed any Beatles music. So they saw the Western body, they saw Sham Sundar, 
West, young West, Western man. He said, have you got any Beatles music? Have you got any records of the Beatles you could give us? So Shamduk Sundar said, he said, well, I've got the guru of the Beatles here with me. You know, I can. <laughs> and so he brought them to meet Prabhupada. And, they, and the Russian boy just immediately took to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada gave the example. He said, just like when you cook rice, you take one grain. If one grain is cooked and soft, you know all the rice is cooked. He said, from this one boy, one Russian boy, you could understand the mood of the Russian people. And Prabhupada then told Gopal Krishna Maharaj and many other devotees, they should go there to Russia and to Eastern Europe and they should introduce Krishna consciousness. And so that created one of the, a very big field of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said, devotees of Krishna are everywhere. They're just waiting for us to go there and to find them. Who's going to do it? You spend your whole life sitting in the corporate office, air conditioned, sitting over a computer, artificial lighting. You think that is a healthy life? It is not healthy materially. And it is suicide spiritually. One young lady came to me the other day. She was telling me she's working for one, the top four. She's in one of the top four companies in Gurgaon. One of the top four companies in India. One of the big, she said, I, she, I, I always wanted to work in this company. Finally, I got the job there. She said, now, I, she said, I can't bear it. It's terrible. The stress is so great. She said, I don't want to continue this job anymore. So that was a typical example. What happens? You get these big jobs. You work for somebody. I know people work for Intel. They work for Intel. You are on call 24 hours a day. Any time of the day and night, they can call you up and you have to immediately drop everything and go there and do whatever is required. To hell with your sadhana. <laughs> That's a fact. Your, your sadhana suffers. You, don't, you cannot have a regulated lifestyle. You cannot balance the material and the spiritual very easily in such conditions makes it very difficult how to manage it well we have to have krishna consciousness you have to consider what is important for you is it important for you that you have a big bank balance at the time of death is it important for you that you leave a nice house and a car for your children next life you don't know where is your what is your destiny where you're going to go you have to consider your own life Prabhupada quotes swopam apiyasya dharmasya triyate in this endeavor there is no loss or diminution and a little advancement made saves us from the greatest danger. The danger being, now we have the human body, but you don't know the future. Prabhupada said, dog is running on four legs and we're on four wheels, but business is the same. Where is food? Where is sex? Where is sleep? That is not human life. That is just the Dvipada Pashu, the two-legged animal. We should understand the value of human life, that we have a golden opportunity in this human life. The opportunity is to take advantage of the association of devotees and use it to become Krishna conscious.
You may say, oh, I may, I may fall down. I may be overwhelmed by material desires. But Lord Krishna describes what will be your destiny. Even if you do fall down, even if you're not successful, next life, if you've only done a little devotional service, next life you go to higher planets and you enjoy sense gratification there. And then when you come back here, you take birth in, a, in, a, in an aristocratic family, in a pious and cultured family. Or if you practice for a long time and still not fully successful, you will take birth in a family of devotees. In a family of devotees, from the beginning of life, you have the opportunity to cultivate Krishna consciousness. Just like Srila Prabhupada and Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. I don't know, maybe some of you were also born in pious devotee families. I certainly wasn't. I was born in the Western culture. I was brought up in a materialistic society. But I was very fortunate that at an early age, I got the mercy of the pure devotee and I contacted the Krishna consciousness movement. And although it's been difficult, although I can't tell you that it's so easy, I did have difficulties, there are troubles, it's not easy, but I held tightly to Krishna consciousness. And I never ever thought of going away and giving up Krishna consciousness. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Hare Yes, thank you. It's a good question. Yes, we have to start at the top. You know, if you read the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is describing different levels of devotion. So he begins at the top and he describes the highest level of devotion. The one who thinks of Krishna at every moment without deviation, then that is devotional service. But then Lord Krishna comes down to the next level. He said, you can't do that. He said, then practice the principles of bhakti yoga. And in this way, you develop a desire to attain me. Principles of bhakti yoga, Prabhupada explains mean waking up early in the morning, uh, worshipping Krishna, chanting the holy name, studying books like Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, cooking food and offering to Krishna. Like this, is uh, the principles of bhakti yoga. So someone may say, well, I can't do that either. Difficult for me, these things. Then Krishna said, okay, then you can do karma yoga, right? So he does 
give, there are different levels. He explained, you can't do bhakti yoga, then do karma yoga. Karma yoga means karmarpana, offering the, the fruit of your work to Krishna. You can do like that. And maybe you can't do that either. So then Krishna said that, then, you know, like some people say, no, don't give to Hare Krishna. No. <laughs> you can give to Mother Teresa. Okay. <laughs> you know? So you do so. so you can't give to the Krishna consciousness movement. You can't give for Krishna, but sacrifice the results of your work for some other cause, do welfare activities and so on. And in this way, you'll be detached. But of course, if you're not giving for a spiritual purpose, as material. You're just giving for some welfare work, some for you know, feeding the poor or something like that. That's a welfare activity. It's not spiritual, but it helps you to cultivate detachment. And then you can go on, gradually go on. So there are different levels. Yeah, I'm presenting the top, the, I'm encouraging these young men, right? They're young men. And they have their whole life before them. So I want to really impress upon them what is the opportunity available to them. That there's this opportunity that you can dedicate your life to Krishna consciousness. But if you can't do it, then there's, there's other alternatives. If you can't achieve the highest level, yeah, as the gentleman says, you're not able to just give everything immediately to Krishna, then practice. And you can practice bhakti yoga. You can't practice bhakti yoga, you find that difficult, then what about karma yoga? Try to do some karma yoga. Karma yoga also difficult? Okay, then you're, you're coming off the spiritual ladder, you're coming, you're on the material platform, but cultivate some detachment. And this, this way gradually you can progress. So thank you for that. It's a very, very relevant question. And certainly you're right that I was presenting something maybe very elevated, very high, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's why they don't have any questions, you see. <laughs> They're so shocked, you know. <laughs> the thought of everything, you know, the thought of everything they've been working through, you know, all the examinations and all the courses they've done, and I'm here sitting saying, it's all useless. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Yes. Dhanavad Prana Maharaj. Dhanavad Prana Maharaj. Maharaj, you told about this top level devotees who has the capability to do Bhakti Yoga completely unalloyed. But this sometimes as a part of preaching, who has this much of capability to completely engage in Bhakti Yoga, they might have to involve with materialistic things like they uh, as a part of preaching they might have to go for higher studies years together five years ten years like that so they are dealing with materialistic things so now this one comes under karma yoga or it comes under bhakti yoga well it's not pure bhakti yoga if you're going to cultivate take up some course or something with, with some spiritual purpose in mind, that will come. But in the, the studies themselves are not bhakti yoga. The studies you're doing, not, Prabhupada allowed it, just like uh, Rabindra Swarup Prabhu, one of the scholarly devotees in our movement, he was taking a PhD in religious studies. And so he was telling Prabhupada, you know, I'm going to have to study things like Shankaracharya. And you've warned that anybody who hears Shankaracharya, they can be doomed. 
He said, but I'm going to have to study these things. So is it all right? And Prabhupada said, yeah. He said, yeah, you do it, but you have to be careful. So that is the point. You're going to do these kind of things in the name of, for your spiritual, you know, that you want to use it later on in Krishna consciousness. Just like Prabhupada did want devotees to preach in academic circles. So you do it, but it's risky. You have to be very careful. Is it bhakti yoga? Yeah, I can't tell you that you, you, know, you study things which are nothing to do with bhakti yoga that is bhakti yoga. Like, Maharaj, for suppose the, the sorry, the de the devotee is not interested in this. Uh, he is interested to completely sacrifice everything for Krishna. But the authority, as a part of preaching, instruct him that you better do studies so that you can attract people uh, to come into Krishna consciousness. So even though his desire was to pure bhakti. But he was ordered by authority to do uh, involved with these material things. Uh, then, uh, what about his uh, devotion? Well, well it, it's a risk, and it's not true that just because you do studies, you can attract people into Krishna consciousness. I don't fully agree with everything, but everybody has their different ideas how to preach. Now, for some people, they may want to preach like that. You may try it, but it's, there's, it's certainly risky. You take a risk. You, you have to go in there and, and take up material stuff. But somehow, you, if you're able to use it and do something for Krishna, okay, that's good. But there are people who went to Prabhupada and said, I want to study this. this and, but Prabhupada would tell them, you just concentrate, study my books. Everything is in my books. You know, you don't need to worry with all these things. Yeah, these different professors of philosophy and religious Hindu studies and so on, they want us to be their students. They can't get the students. They, their departments are empty. They don't have many people there in their departments. They don't get many people studying these things. They want us to come and be their students. So it's, it's certainly a risky endeavor to go into these things and take up preaching. You have to consider though, if you, can, if you really think you can get some results from it, you can try. Just like Ridayananda Maharaj, he took a PhD from Harvard in Sanskrit and he did it. He completed it. Then he took on a position as a professor and he was teaching and he gave it up. He just, the field, the, you know, that he just didn't find the, the, the opportunity for the preaching. It just wasn't there. And similarly, Krishna Shetra Maharaj. Now, Sh Krishna Shetra Maharaj took his PhD from Oxford. And he, we arranged for him to come to Hong Kong. And we paid money, a lot of money, to Hong Kong University, one university in Hong Kong, so that we could have a course in Hindu studies, something in the university there. And he came there and he taught it. He taught it a couple of years. He didn't want to teach it anymore. He said, it's just not the kind of preaching I want to do. It's just not what I want to be involved in. And the, the, he, uh, he made one devotee. He, did, we, he got one devotee, a, a woman, a, a young woman. But that's, you know, so much endeavor. And what, what's the result? You don't get such a big result from it all. So much endeavor, so many years of studying and everything. Of course, he, he, because he's a PhD, he's recognized around the world. He can go any university, they'll welcome him. The PhD from Oxford. But it just doesn't give him, it does, he just didn't get the, 
the real it got much more it gets more results just preaching general krishna consciousness you go into these universities and you have to preach the the way they work the way they present things tamal krishna marriage told me he said he was at the university and he said something like chaitanya mahaprabhu is the avatar or something, or the avatar of Krishna and the Kali Yuga, and the, the professor said, that is your brainwashed propaganda. He said, you cannot talk like that in academic circles. You have to understand, you know, academic circles, you know, how they talk and how they present everything, how, you know, it, it's all, you know, it's not really full on preaching. And Prabhupada met. So there was the one professor came in and he said to Prabhupada, How can you work, worship a God who is an adulterer? Do you know adulterer? You know adultery? It means you have more than one wife. So he said, How can you worship a God who is an adulterer? Prabhupada said to the man, It is you who are the adulterer. All women belong to Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada never studied like that. You know, he, he, he Prabhupada didn't take these kind of degrees and that you know, he just preached. He learned everything from the Shastra. And he had that potency to impress people with Krishna consciousness. So academic studies on themselves, you know, you have to judge. Let me see. Let's see it. Let's see the results. You know, I, I know people with be I'm telling Ridayananda Maharaj, Tamal Krishna, he didn't finish his PhD. There's another Amoga Leela, another proper disciple, also PhD. He's trying to preach. He's trying to in a different, very, very special. I won't mention it, but, you know, I haven't seen any result. But Krishna Shetra Maharaj, there, there are several devotees. They spend years, it takes years of study to get their PhDs. And then what can you do with it? You can't really do that much. Thank you, Mohan. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So you said that uh, we should give up uh, and we do only surrender to Krishna. So is it our duty to uh, duty that we should sur only surrender to Krishna or by surrendering to Krishna and also doing uh, duties, earning money so that we have some food and offer it to Krishna. Uh, uh, so is we can earn money for Krishna or we should only surrender to Krishna and we should only uh, depend on Krishna. Well, if you want to start at the top, yeah, <laughs> you should only surrender to Krishna. You don't have to worry about earning money. There's so many other people out there, you know, in cyber city, software world, everywhere. They're all earning money. There are so many people are earning money. You, you don't have to worry about earning money. Just try to become Krishna conscious. So the most important thing is to become Krishna conscious. Prabhupada went to America with no money. But he was a success. We came to India. But the, the Delhi temple, Prabhupada was in the train. And one man came to the train when the train stopped in Delhi. And one man said, why don't you open a temple in Delhi? And Prabhupada immediately turned to the devotee next to him, Guru Das. He said, Guru Das, get off the tree. <laughs> and then he said, Here, here's 50 rupees. And that's how the Delhi temple started. And he said, you should meet, the, meet Indira Gandhi. Meet the, meet the leaders of the country. And they did. You can see the picture, Guru Das and Banu Swami is there, and Yamuna Maharaj, they met Indira Gandhi. They, they didn't have any money. 
Krishna will give them money. Krishna is not a poor man. <laughs> but Prabhuji, how will I get that faith that I will depend on Krishna for? You chant Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhuji. Yeah, you just chant Hare Krishna and you stay in the association of devotees. You read Prabhupada's books and you hear. By hearing everything, comes. hearing is the most important thing. And that faith will come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, any other question? You can finish it. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Marajin, uh, Western world where you are coming from, most of the people are Christians. So how is that they took up Krishna consciousness, which was uh, apparently another faith? Srila Prabhupada explains, he said, I didn't go to the West to change people's religion. He said, I just want to teach people how to love God. Doesn't matter. He, he, said, he said, people think I'm making people Hindu. He said, he said, I am the only Hindu here. He was in America. He said, I'm the only Hindu. He said, nobody else. He said, but I am teaching people how to love God. There is faith. Faith changes. Your Hindu faith, Muslim faith. Christian faith, you can change your faith. But religion, that is sanatan dharma. That is eternal. The eternal religion is to love God. There is one God. Why do you think there are so many religions? There's only one religion. We have to understand. It's not a question of changing our religion. We have to understand the science of God. Prabhupada taught us who is God. We didn't know who God was. We had no idea what he's like, what his form was, what his teachings are, what his pastimes are. What do you, what do you, what do you know? You know, God, God made the world in seven days. How did he make it? Oh, don't ask these questions. You know, you ask any question like that, nobody, nobody can answer. But everything is there in our books. How the world came about, how the creation took place. All the answers are there. Why there's so much suffering in the world? Yeah, we know why there's suffering. Nobody else could explain. So we got the answers from Krishna consciousness. The answers which we were, we had so many questions, we couldn't get answers. The Krishna consciousness gave us all the answers to all the questions. So this is a real education. The Christian people also respect our Krishna consciousness more. And Prabhupada also respected the Christian saints. Prabhupada was in Australia and they arranged a program for Prabhupada at some uh, convent. It was a monastery and they were all followers of St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi. Now St. Francis of Assisi, there, this, he was a, a vegetarian. And Generally, they, they're, they're still quite active. Some branches are there following St. Francis. But often the people who follow are not vegetarian. But he was a vegetarian. He was strict. And the monks there, they told Prabhupada how that the St. Francis, he used to talk to the trees and to the flowers 
He's saying, my dear brother tree, my dear sister flower. And Prabhupada said, oh, that is real God consciousness. So Prabhupada showed he had respect for other traditions because they, if they had faith, then he would respect, he appreciated that. And Prabhupada said in preaching to Christians, if people won't accept that it's wrong to kill, it's wrong to eat meat, then don't preach anymore. If they cannot understand that meat eating is wrong, don't waste your time talking to them. They're so Prabhupada met this one cardinal in France. Prabhupada went to France and he met this one cardinal who was uh, very famous. He was very famous. And uh, Prabhupada just preached to him about meat eating. And this man, he could not accept. He could not accept that it's wrong to eat meat. Later on, they found out this man died in the bed of a prostitute. He was a cardinal, big man in the church, in the cabinet. But so this is, you know, it goes on, these kind of things. Meat eating is the beginning. You look and you look a little more, you'll find a lot more bad things also. People are eating meat. You see, it's not just meat eating. There's a lot of other things they do as well. So we're trying to show that there is real religion and there are religious principles. We want to educate people on these things. People don't know. They have no idea. They talk about cleanliness. They take a bath once a week. They don't, they don't know what is real mercy. They think mercy is to give a bum, give up a, a beggar money to buy alcohol. Or to share your cigarettes with people. They have no idea what are the real standards of religious principle. And it's only, it's, we're getting this now more from our Krishna consciousness movement. And even in, in Prabhupada's time, there was one devotee, he was, his name was Balavanta, Balavanta Prabhu. His father was a lawyer in America, and Balavanta was very, very powerful preacher, very charismatic preacher. And he formed a party in God We Trust, and he went into the election in America, and he fought the election, and he had his party in God We Trust. And he, they would bring him on television with the other politicians. And he would talk about cleanliness, morality, uh, truthfulness, austerity. And they would say, oh, yes, yes, very good, very good. But <laughs> if you ask them, how, can you follow any, how do you follow this? How do you practice austerity? Oh, I, I work hard, you know, I work hard. I'm working, I'm hardly, I'm not sleeping much. I'm trying to, <laughs> they have no idea how to practice religious principles. They know it's good. They say in America, in God we trust. They put on their dollar, in God we, who is God? Who knows? <laughs> Nobody knows. They hardly anybody knows. We're trying to educate. Education. They talk about education. The education which we are getting today is not actually so important. To be a software engineer, do you think in 20 years time they will still want software engineers? The technology will change. Everything changes. Look at physics, the different phenomena. They, we had the corpuscular theory, and then it went to the wave theory, then it became quantum theory, 
one theory after another, they still haven't got the answers to life. They're still trying to explain what is life. This is education. So we get the truth from Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavad. Krishna said, there is no truth superior to me. Do you believe it? Then you have to surrender to Krishna. If Krishna is the if you accept Krishna as the highest truth, you have to surrender. You have to take shelter of this Krishna consciousness. Okay, it's 9.30. We'll stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash at Nasir Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Maharaj will be giving class today evening also. Evening 7 o'clock in Temple Hall. Haribo. And now we have breakfast for all.